Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support, subscribe. The Difficult Life of Henry VIII's Older Sister, Margaret Tudor. The crowds of Scots who gathered to meet their new queen as she approached Edinburgh in the summer of 1503 were understandably excited. While some of this enthusiasm may have been the product of drink generously supplied for the occasion, there was also a sense of optimism. Scotland wanted a queen. Its king, James, already had seven illegitimate children and they needed a legitimate heir. Now, around 30, James also appreciated the generous dowry and diplomatic advantage of his wife. An English princess was arriving to seal a treaty of perpetual peace between the two kingdoms and to provide the dynamic, ambitious king with the partner who would help him enhance Scotland's prestige. This English princess was Margaret Tudor, the eldest daughter of King Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. She was only 13 at the time, but had been trained for her new role and was determined to prove her worth. Margaret is one of the less spoken about Tudors, yet historians know a great deal about her, and that is tribute to her letters. Margaret had an extensive correspondence with her family members back in England. Margaret's first letter home was in the August of 1503 and was addressed to her father. She had lost her mother three months before and she knew that the chances of seeing her father again were slim. In her letters she betrays her homesickness and her insecurities as she is faced with her new situation. God send me comfort that I and mine that be left here with me be well entreated. I wish I were with you, your grace, now and many times more. I pray God I may find it well for my welfare hereafter. Our Lord have you in his keeping, written with the hand of your humble daughter, Margaret. Henry, however, was determined to demonstrate the power and success of his dynasty through Margaret's progress into Scotland. She was constantly on show, meeting local dignitaries, attending banquets, changing dresses and jewels before she entered the towns along her way. Slim and red-headed, she cut a striking figure in her splendid gowns. She crossed into Scotland on the 1st of August and met her husband at Delkeith Castle a few days later. James had carefully arranged everything for the visit. He was a womaniser and charming and he knew too well how to put his new bride at ease. Although Margaret's letters suggest she did not fully appreciate this. But that being said, she rode with him on his horse into Edinburgh, to the great delight of the people. James guided her through official functions with his arm around her waist. The wedding was as extravagant as they come. A quarter of James's annual income was spent on wine alone and the pair even wore matching outfits for their marriage at Holyrood Abbey. Margaret still felt, however, that he did not spend enough time with her, preferring to talk military matters with the Earl of Surrey, who had escorted her to Scotland, and whose dictatorial manner she resented. She was clearly worried about the long-term treatment she and her servants would receive. Margaret's next letter was to her brother in 1513, Henry VIII and she was furious. We cannot believe that out of your mind or by your command we are so unkindly dealt with in our father's legacy. Our husband knows it is withholden for his sake and will recompense us. We are ashamed therewith and wish God word had never been thereof. It is not worth such estimation as in your divers letters of the same and we lack nothing. Our husband is ever the longer, the better to us. Our God knows. These words, penned by an angry Margaret to her brother Henry VIII, a decade after her arrival in Scotland, show that her fears about her new life north of the border were to prove unfounded. She swiftly settled into her position as Scotland's queen, helped by the attention lavished on her by James. Clothed in rich furs and gowns and showered in jewels, she did indeed lack nothing. And if James was by no means faithful, Margaret would not have known that his favourite mistress, Janet Kennedy, was pregnant with their third child at the time of her wedding. 
He was a considerate husband, easing her into the roles of consort and mother. She did not conceive until she was 16, and then produced a prince, but the child, like several others before the birth of the future James V in 1512, did not survive. The Queen presided with her husband over a cultured court. James's reign saw a flowering of literature and the arts in Scotland, and he and his wife shared a love of music, dancing and balls. Margaret must soon have realised that she had married a capable, popular ruler. James was a polymath whose interest ranged from naval matters to dentistry, and he was committed to being seen as a key player in Europe. But his policies were to bring him into conflict with his young brother-in-law in England and deepen a rift between Margaret and Henry, which may have had its origins in a reported childish spat where she, as a queen, briefly took precedence over him. Henry refused to pay Margaret the money and possessions left to her by both her father and brother, Prince Arthur Tudor. She was furious at this insult, but there was worse to come. Eighteen months later, Margaret's life was completely changed. Relations between England and Scotland increasingly volatile collapsed as Henry VIII declared war on France and the French king requested the aid of his Scottish allies. The decision by James to invade England was not, however, taken lightly. Margaret's opposition to the move has been overstated. Her earlier letter suggests strong support for her husband and she was already in the early stages of another pregnancy, yet tragedy awaited. James engaged in English at the Battle of Flodden in September of 1513 on a remote hillside in Northumberland. His army outnumbered the English and boasted the latest military technology, but James had no experience of commanding a large force. The willingness of his opponent, combined with the treacherous marshy terrain, resulted in terrible slaughter. 10,000 Scots perished, among them the king himself. Margaret was left a widow at the age of 23. Margaret's next letter shows her fear for both hers and the life of her children in 1514. My partly advisory continues in their malice and proceeds in their parliament usurping the king's authority, as if I and my lords were of no reputation, reputing us as rebels, wherefore I beseech that you would make haste with your army, by sea and land, brother, all the welfare of me and my children rest in your hands. Margaret was shocked at the death of her husband, but she carried on with great calmness and resolution. She immediately took her son to Stirling Castle for his protection, and there he was crowned king on the 21st of September. Margaret was then named regent, but with one condition. Her late husband wrote in his will that Margaret was to be named, but only if she did not remarry. But Scotland was an extremely patriarchal country, and Margaret was an English woman. Exercising any power would always be difficult. Margaret gave birth to another son in April of 1514, but in August of the same year, she made a serious misjud misjudgment. Margaret remarried, and her new husband was the Earl of Angus, and a member of a very powerful family with a history of dividing Scottish politics. Margaret's need for a strong male to lean on cost her her regency, and began a prolonged period of faction fighting. Desperate to hold on to power and to protect her children, Margaret begged her brother for help, but that was to no avail. The Duke of Albany, by reason of his might and power, did take from me the king and duke, my said tender children. He removed and put me from out of my said castle, being my enfeffment paid by the king and my father of most blessed memory, and by his crafty and subtle ways made me signify in writing to the Pope's holiness and to my dearest brother the King of England and the King of France that I of my own mooting and free will did renounce my said office of two tricks and governess. By the time the embittered Margaret wrote this official denunciation of the Duke of Albany, in 1516, she had been forced to flee into England, where she gave birth to a final child, her daughter by Angus, Lady Margaret Douglas. 
she wrote to Albany, the regent of Scotland who had replaced her, to announce the child's arrival. So it is that, by the grace of Almighty God, I am delivered, and have a Christian soul, being a young lady. Her letter was sent in October of 1515, from Harbottle Castle in Northumberland. Margaret's words reveal the depth of her anguish. John Stuart, Duke of Albany, was cousins to James, and next in line to the Scottish throne after James V. He had been born and raised in France, and knew little of Scotland. Margaret, to begin with, found Albany charming, but Henry VIII's further undermined her position when he tried to have her sons kidnapped and brought to England. Determined to rule Scotland justly, Albany realised that he must gain control of the royal children, and when, Mar and when Margaret refused, he besieged Stirling Castle, and the Queen was forced to submit. In a dramatic gesture, intended to reinforce her son's authority as king, she made little James V hand over the keys. Margaret had all the Tudor flair for a public occasion. In September of 1515, Margaret decided that to fight was the only option. She was heavily pregnant and leaving all her belongings behind, she rode to the English border with Angus. This would be the last time her second husband would help her. The long and difficult labour was only brightened for a short while by the arrival of new dresses from London but then saddened by the death of Margaret's youngest son in December, her world had truly fallen apart. Margaret then sought solace in the company of her sister Mary and brother Henry VIII. They had been separated for 13 years, and although Henry treated her well, he did not want Margaret to stay. He believed her place was in Scotland. Taking his daughter, Lady Margaret Douglas, with him, the Earl, who had fallen out with Albany, fled to France and then to England, where Lady Margaret was brought up at court. Feisty and attractive, she never really knew her mother, though her uncle proved an affectionate guardian. In 1524, however, Queen Margaret's time appeared to have come again. Albany returned to France and the Queen and her supporters declared the 12-year-old James V of age to rule. Assuming the regency again, Margaret, who wanted a divorce, was not about to share power with Angus, and fired the guns of Edinburgh Castle on him when he appeared with armed men. Her success was short-lived, and at the end of 1525, Angus tricked fellow politicians and assumed full control of the king. For three years, the boy chafed under the restrictions of his hated stepfather while his mother outraged Henry VIII by pursuing her campaign for a divorce. Margaret's marriage to Angus was annulled by the Pope in 1527, the year Henry VIII began divorce proceedings against Catherine of Aragon. The following Easter, James V broke free from the defamation of the Douglases and Angus fled again to England. Margaret was elated as she had fallen in love with a member of her household, Henry Stuart and at the age of 39 wanted to marry again. Her son gave permission, but extracted a high price. He would not tolerate Margaret's future meddling in Scottish politics. The Queen felt sidelined and increasingly aggrieved. The more so, as her third marriage was as unsuccessful as the union with Angus, Henry Stuart exploited her financially and was unfaithful. Relief and a sense of fulfilment came from an unexpected source. Mary of Guise, James V's second wife. This attractive and clever French noblewoman paid due attention to Margaret, and the old queen spent more time at court. In 1541, tragedy struck when Margaret's two grandsons died within days of each other, leaving their parents devastated. Her support at this desperate time was greatly appreciated. But Margaret's own life was drawing to a close. In October of 1541, she suffered a stroke at Mativan Castle, outside Perth, and died before her son could reach her. She was buried at St John's Abbey in the city, alongside other Scottish rulers. During the Reformation, Margaret's tomb was desecrated and her skeleton burned, probably because she was English and Catholic. Like her first husband James, she has no monument, but she would no doubt have been pleased that it was their great-grandson James who united the crowns of England and Scotland in 1603. Thank you for watching and to support.
please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.